we're excited you're here at church today. We hope you are enjoy church. Um, I love church, just so you know, in case you didn't know that. Um, thank you, Leah. We got friends. Everyone say hi. Oh, I was talking about the fish, but hi, Leah. Thank you. They like you more than the fish. That's good, because the fish were only 20 cents a piece. And I rescued them. I rescued them. Because if you do not know this, at pet stores that have turtles, they use these fish to feed the turtles. So I actually rescued these guys. So gives my random act of kindness. Hashtag love on purpose, MH. There we go. But we're excited you're here today. My name's Aaron. I get to be one of the pastors here at Real Life Church. And I hope that you are excited to be at church today. And what is coming up next week? Easter. We love Easter at Real Life Church. We love every Sunday, but we, will, we do Easter big, and we're excited about that. We're going to have several opportunities for you to be a part of our Easter services here. The first one being Friday night at 6, a good Friday service. with uh, We're going to have all kinds of good stuff for kids. We're gonna, the service will look just like it does on Sunday morning, and then three opportunities on Sunday in person at 8.30, 10, and 11.30, and then our online experience at 6. Here's what we're going to ask. We don't have enough seats here at church for Easter. So if it works for you, if you could pick a service, whether maybe it's still this one, but maybe if you could slide to that Friday night one at six o'clock, that would be fantastic. So we can make room for every person that's gonna be here for Easter, every person that you're gonna invite, and we get to be excited about celebrating what Jesus has done. If it's your first time here today, from me, from our church, I just wanna say thank you for being here. We're excited that you're here. We're honored that you're here. And we look forward to being able to walk through life with you. And we hope that you love being here as much as we love you. But I'm excited about getting to share this word that God's put on my heart today to kind of conclude this Love on Purpose series that Pastor Vince has been walking us through. I love how he set it up um, at the beginning going through February with how we love the people close to us. We love our wives. We love our spouse. We love our kids, our friends, our family, that whole dynamic of those closest to us. And then now we're diving into loving our community how we can serve those around us, how we can notice the little things, how we can take the great commission, as he's talked about the last two weeks, of how it's not just being a church of evangelism or being a church of a discipleship. It's twofold, and we have to do both. I love how he's done that, and I I love our pastor. He's such an incredible person. Can we give him honor for a second? Because he's not just a pastor, not just a preacher. He's just a great man of God, and I love getting to serve because he genuinely cares for each and every one of you and for us as a staff. And uh, he's taking some time with his family to spring break this week, so they're on their way back. And so we're excited for them to come back rejuvenated and ready for Easter. But I do have to be transparent and honest for a second. Because as a church we do, but me in particular, we pick on him a little bit. Because of this thing, this trend in his life called McDonald's. And like we pick on him because he goes once a day, if not twice a day, or maybe three times a day, depending on the day. And they like know his name, they know his order, all that good stuff at McDonald's. And I pick on him because like we'll get into conversations about what the best food is. Like where would you go? And I said, well, is it better than McDonald's? And he'll come back with sometimes best doesn't mean preference, Aaron. And so we go through that. But I got to be honest for a minute. Because just as he's talked about being woke up and wrecked by God in the drive through McDonald's, God kind of revealed something to me the last couple of weeks. Um, two weeks ago, we were on our way to Springfield to take our little one back to the zoo. And so we planned the trip so where when we left the house, it would be during his nap time. So when we got to Springfield, he would be waking up and ready to go. Well, he fell asleep about Yellville, so we're like, perfect. This got another, we got another hour, hour and a half in here of driving around that he's going to sleep through. So we pulled into McDonald's in Harrison to get something to eat. Now, it's only been about 30 minutes, and I get to the window, and I begin to give the sweet lady at the window of my card to pay for the meal. And from the back seat, I hear, cheeseburger? <laughs> Meaning, us as a family, or me as a father, have been to McDonald's enough that my two-year-old now recognizes the McDonald's drive through window. And he knew what he was ready to order and what he wanted. So I just got to kind of come clean about that. But I'm excited to share with you today and dive into this. If you have a notebook, if you have a phone, something that you take notes on, I would love for you to title this and begin to take notes because leaders do take notes. Title this just these three things real quick. The intentional, the intimate, and the intense. The intentional, the intimate, the intense. 
And with what Pastor Vince has shared the last couple of weeks about the Great Commission and going out and evangelizing and, and building up and, and encouraging disciples, there's a verse I want to break down before I really get into the meat of what we're going to talk about today. And at the beginning of 2021, as a staff, we sat down and we talked about some non-negotiables, things that as a staff that we wanted to make sure were always the standard. And one of the things that Pastor Vince talked about and that we said absolutely to was the fact that the gospel is in everything. And by saying that, I mean that we believe and we teach scripture, not just life application and good advice, but we dive into the word of God and we see what God has given us to take from that. Not just life application, but a live and active scripture that applies to what we walk through each and every day and the goodness of God and what he reveals to us through his word. So today we're going to dive into a passage that I think we skip over a lot of times where we just know the story of and we don't dissect it enough. But the first thing I want to read is this, Ezekiel 3.18. And this is going to wake you up, or at least it should. Because this convicts me every single time I read it. Ezekiel 3.18, it won't be on the screen because I added it this morning, but it says, when I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, and then you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, then that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. Meaning... When Jesus shows you someone or puts someone in your path, in your life, and says, hey, they need to know about me, and we dismiss that, we put it to the side, and we move on, and whatever happens to them happens, there will become a time, because we missed that, ignored that, that we'll be accountable for the blood of them to be on our hands. And if that doesn't wake you up, if that doesn't make you sick to your stomach, I don't know what else to tell you this morning about reaching people. We're going to dive into this encounter that Jesus sets up and gives us to look into. Now, I'm going to read from John chapter 4. And I'm going to actually read 28 verses. Glenn Taylor in the background just went, Aaron, come on. I'm not going to read them all from the beginning, though, but I'm going to break them down, and and I'm going to read and break down, read and break down, just kind of like Pastor Vince did last week. But John chapter 4, verse number 1 says this. It says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he's already giving leadership to other people who are walking alongside him, if you look at that. Jesus is already, he's still on earth, but he's giving power and authority through him to those who are walking close to them, as they are the ones that are baptizing, not him. Verse 3, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour. And then a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food, and the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, He said, If you knew the gift of God, and who is saying this to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. I'm going to pause there. I'm going to pray real quick, and then we're going to dive into this. If you bow with me for a second, church. God, we thank you. God, we thank you for everything you've set up. God, we thank you for every person that's in this room today. God, we thank you for every person that's watching online. God, I pray today that there would be something that stirs within them, an eagerness, an excitement, a desire, God, to make your name known. God, that we would recognize what you've set up. God, we would recognize that while we're here, God, to bring you glory and honor. God, for every person that's going to hear this message in this moment, God, or one later on, 
God, that you would change something within them. God, that you would encourage them. God, that you would challenge them. God, we thank you as a church that we get to be here and that we get to do this. God, that you have something in store for each and every person. God, that you called everybody to something. God, that you create us individually unique. God, we look forward to being able to celebrate the wins, to celebrate the life change that you have in store through these next weeks, God, through, through the, the history of Real Life Church, God. And as we go into Easter, to celebrate, God. For every invite that we'll hand out, we give you the glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so in this... Jesus has set up a very intentional encounter, similar to what these cards kind of do. The invite cards that we've got for you to go invite to people at church, or the, the challenge cards of pay it forward, or random act of kindness, or take five, invite five. It's all intentional in order for you to be able to show someone who Jesus is. Beautiful thing about the invite cards is when you hashtag, if you don't know how to, there's a how-to video on our Facebook page. When you hashtag, every time that you hashtag love on purpose MH or love on purpose GV, then the church as an organization gets to partner with organizations within our community to give food, clothes, resources, finances to other organizations, and we get to be a church that impacts our community with an intentional encounter that we've set up through those. But in this encounter... Jesus has intentionally set out to have a meeting with someone. That person not knowing that they're about to meet someone, much less Jesus. So in this time, Jews and Samaritans was highly, highly intense in racial diversity, racial division. They didn't even interact. They weren't supposed to interact with each other. They actually, it says, as Jesus was going, that they had to go through Samaria. But the fact is that Jesus said they had to go through Samaria. Because Jews and Samaritans had separate highways. Which means Jesus went out of his way to make sure this encounter took place. Not only did he do that, but he sent the disciples away to go get food. So Jesus is setting up an intentional one-on-one encounter with someone in this moment. Now, the the racial tension in this is so strong that it's hard for us to imagine or recognize or we thought it was until we actually started experiencing it in our real life today. You see, it's crazy how the Bible works because a lot of the same issues that we're walking through today are just packaged a little bit different to the ones that took place in Scripture. But a lot of them are exactly the same that we face today. And so there's this tension that's taking place of this woman at the well And she's gone at an intentional time to make sure she wasn't going to be around anybody else. And Jesus set up an intentional time to make sure he was going to meet with someone there. And so they're there at the highest point of the day, the hottest point of the day. And she she walks up seeing that there's a man at the well already. And you've got to be thinking about the thoughts that are probably going through her head at this moment. Why is someone here? I'm coming here because at this time there's not supposed to be anybody here. Why is he here? What's he doing here? It's a Jewish man. What's he going to do to me? What, what's, I'm, I don't know. Like, so she's probably even thinking, like, should I even go to the well at this point? Now, the well, everybody had to go to the well then. Because the natural well that it was, was what you needed to survive. You have to have water to survive. So everybody else during the mornings, everyone else in town would go to the well and they would draw water. Because one, it was the coolest part of the day. So it was the less intense part. And two, you had water to last you throughout the day. You didn't have to go back and refill. You you were set for the day. And then tomorrow you could come back and get more water. Everyone brought a pail, a bucket to draw the water from and to take it back home. Jesus is there, didn't bring anything to draw water with. Because he was going expecting to have an encounter set up. And so she walks up. And she notices this Jewish man and he says, give me a drink of water. And she's all confused and begins to have this conversation with him. Because at this natural well you have to have to survive, she begins to ask the questions. And Jesus begins to ask questions to give answers that weren't even really partaking to what she was talking about. And she didn't realize this at that moment. You see, the natural well, we have to have things in order to survive. We have to have the water 
from the well in order to survive. We have to have food or sustenance to give us energy to go about our day. We have to have policies and procedures to protect us. We have to have systems. We have to have all these things. But when it comes to the natural, things evolve and things change based on needs. But when at the end of the day comes, if there's no natural there, you die. Because at some point in time, the natural changes and it shifts or it dries up. So you need natural to survive. And that's what Jesus is trying to set up that you don't just need the natural. You need more than that. And so they're having this conversation. And I want you to think about how long this conversation probably took. We get a few verses of it. But in reality, it probably took several minutes, if not hours of back and forth. Because if you were sitting with Jesus, he set up an intentional encounter with you. How long would you take to talk to him? How many questions would you ask? How many times would you let him talk? And so they have this intentional encounter. And this woman begins to kind of ask these questions and try to figure out who this man is or, or why he's there. And the intentionality that Jesus has goes even beyond this encounter. This intentionality goes on to you and I. Because the intentionality that Jesus always has with every encounter goes way before our parents even thought about us. It goes all the way back to the time of creation. The time we, we, he, creation took place, God was thinking about where you were going to be, what you were going to do, and all that you could amount to and possibly be, that you were going to be in this room at this moment. Jesus set up an intentional encounter at a moment for you to say yes to him. Jesus set up an intentional encounter for you to share him with someone else. He's all about intentionality because you, he knows that you're different from the person sitting next to you. He knows that you have a different gift set. He knows that you have different passions. And he is most proud of us as a creation than he is anything else that he's ever created. More proud than these goldfish up here that are so pretty. I'll tell you what, these goldfish have had a crazy day. Because in first service, the original bowl got busted. <laughs> and it was like, like a horror scene. And so it was crazy because it was behind the screen and someone kicked a light on accident and it busted the jar. And so the fish are on the floor and the rocks are on the floor and there's water and glass everywhere. And everyone's like, Eden, who was up here singing a little bit ago and just so great. She's like, oh, no, the fish. Someone get the fish. And I'm like, someone just get the water off the stage so it doesn't ruin the screen and the cords. And so we're freaking out. And we have this like, horror scene behind right before worship was about to start. But he cares about you more than these goldfish. We care about you more than the goldfish. And he set up these intentional encounters. And so he begins to talk to this woman. He's going through this. And, and he gets to this moment. And she says in verse 15, and she says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water any longer. We're going to get into the intimate part of this conversation. In verse 16, it says, Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him and said, I have no husband. And so then Jesus said to her, you are right in saying that I have no husband. Of course, like Jesus knows everything. So. For you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. So what you have said is true. And the woman said to him, so I perceive that you are a prophet. Like she's looking at him like, okay, like, who are you? What are you like? Are you a prophet? Why are you calling me out? What are we doing here? What's, what's up with this? Verse 20 says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we, we read this, and he begins to dive into who she is. Now think about when she's walking to the well at this moment, before this even takes place. She's honestly probably thinking if she's going to survive the day. Because if you look at who she is, as she begins to unpack that, as Jesus begins to tell her who she is, and being married five times and now living with another man, she's basically the town whore. So she goes to the well in the middle of the day so that she doesn't have to talk to anybody else. So that she doesn't have to take the looks of everybody looking at her. She doesn't have to hear the stories about what her past was and everybody talks about. She intentionally goes to the well so she can isolate and not be around anybody else. 
which is one of Satan's greatest tools is isolation. Because he's saying, everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows who you've been with. You're probably going to see one of your five husbands at the well this morning. So why don't you go at a time that's hot, that's miserable, so no one else will see you and you don't have to deal with everybody else. But yet, in the middle of that, Jesus set up an intentional encounter of her mess to meet with her at that spot. Now, when she's walking to the well, she's walking and she sees a man that's obviously of a different race. She sees a man that looks totally different. As she's walking to the well, she's thinking, why is he here? He's not even supposed to be near where we're at. They have a totally different road to travel on. So women, females in the room today, if I were to ask you, you're going somewhere and you see a male sitting next to your destination all by himself, basically just waiting on you, what thoughts begin to run through your head? You begin to wonder what's going to happen to me. What's going to happen here? Is there anybody here that's going to be watching? Is there going to be anybody here to protect me? She's probably wondering in this moment now, he's here because nobody else cares about me. So will anybody even come to my rescue at this point in time? Will even he even care if something happens to me? But Jesus sits and he waits. And she begins to walk and begins to question why a man of another race is sitting at her ready to have conversation with her. And so he asks her to give her to give him a drink. And she says, well, how am I going to give you a drink? You have nothing to draw water with. And this is where the natural well then becomes the supernatural. Because the natural well is what you have to have to survive, but will ultimately dry out. But the supernatural well is what you need to live. And so where Jesus came and he's asked for a drink at this moment, he begins to then pour out the supernatural and return on her. And this conversation continues. And she asks, are you not greater than our father Jacob who dug this well for his family to provide for his family and the livestock that were living here? Are you not greater than him in order for you to drink from this well? And so I'm sure she gives him a drink because, again, this is probably a long conversation. And he's a natural, he's a human being that has things he needs, desires. He has things that has to have in order to survive. So she probably gives him the drink in order to continue the conversation because she's obviously intrigued at this moment. And so we get into the intimate conversation of where Jesus begins to reveal who she is. But at the same time, he's revealing this isn't who she was meant to be, but the potentials that are ahead of her if she taps into the supernatural well that he will provide to her. See, it's the same thing that happens with us. We try and isolate and we try to come to these moments where we have our past and the Satan's trying to tell us about our past when Jesus is trying to recognize and tell you and reveal to you that the natural well is good. You need that, but it's, you need more than that. You need the supernatural in order to live and not just survive. And so he begins to talk to this woman and he's revealing to her who she is. He's walking her through the intimate and intricate details of who she has create, been created to be. And that's the beautiful thing about being a Christian. The, being a Christian isn't about just picking and choosing or trying to follow guidelines or follow a checklist of who you are. The, the beauty about being a Christian is that you get to find out the realization and the revealing of who you were actually created to be. As Jesus pulls back the layers of, no, that's not you. This is you. This is the decision you can make now. The past is behind. The new was here. You've been made new. And she begins to recognize that what this man is talking about isn't about just taking a drink from this well. So we set up an intentional encounter. They've gone into this intimate conversation. And then it begins to get pretty intense. We see this realization, this shift in who she is and what she's thinking about as we get into the end of, of the passage. It says in verse 25, it says, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Verse 27 says, just then the disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? Sit on that for a second. This is a totally different picture of the disciples than what they're normally like in a situation like this. 
Normally, when they come into a situation where Jesus isn't around someone he's supposed to be around, they step up and they say, hey, you're, you need to go eat. We just brought food back. You need to go over here and, have a, hang, and get what you need to survive. Hey, she's a Samaritan woman. Why are you even talking to her? Why did we come this way? We need you to come over here and, don't, don't, and start to think about the public perception of you talking to this woman. Usually, the disciples get in the way of these kinds of things happening. But in this encounter, they sit back. And they learn and they listen because they see that obviously there's a racial tension there, but the tension no longer exists because the conversation has now gone more intimate and past what these people look like. See, that's one thing that Pastor Vince did last week with an illustration that was so great is setting people up here about, I think too many times as, as he showed us that We go and we only share Jesus with the people that we like. The ones in our bias, the ones that have the similar interests, the ones who are in the same social bracket as us. When the bias and the filters that we put on our lives should actually be erased because we are called to reach all people. No matter what they look like, no matter what they say, no matter what they've done. And this is, Jesus is doing all of that in this encounter right here. Someone of a different race. Someone who has an ugly history. Someone who was scared to have a conversation. He's setting all this up and removing every filter, every bias to have an intentional encounter, an intimate conversation that's going to have an intense moment. And the disciples are watching and learning. So in this moment right here, we go in and when the disciples get back, and so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Immediately she's had a shift. She's gone from trying to avoid everybody around her or everybody that might know anything about her to running into the middle of the city saying, I just met this dude who will give you something different and change your world. I think this is the one we've been waiting on. See, these fish, they're 20 cent goldfish that you can get in nearly any pet store. I think I've actually picked this same guy all, all day, so I'm sorry, but if I were to take this fish in this moment and just kind of right here, just flip him and let him lay on the stage, you just went, <gasps> Some of you, mom, what's he doing? He's still breathing. Some of you had a more intimate, passionate reaction about a 20 cent goldfish that I've put on the floor than you do about your neighbor, your friend, your family member that's going to go to hell. The, The reaction that took place behind the screen this morning when the goldfish hit the floor and there's glass everywhere. We care so much about the little things. We care about the little things more, a 20 cent goldfish more than someone's eternity, who, someone who has immeasurable value to Jesus. One of the, another great thing about the goldfish is in the animal kingdom, a goldfish has the shortest memory of any other animal. Their memory span is just about 10 seconds. So in the time now that the goldfish was on the floor or that they were behind the screen, he's forgotten, she's forgotten. I don't know, I can't tell the gender of a goldfish. The goldfish has forgotten that it was even flopping and almost died on the stage. But Satan tries to flip that on us. See, he says that you've been around that person for 10 years in You've never told them about Jesus, so how are you going to tell them at this point? That person knows that you've been married X amount of times and you're doing what you're doing right now with the one that you're with. And so how are you going to tell them? He begins to remind you of all the things rather than you recognizing that the faithfulness that you should be showing and the intentional encounters that Jesus is continually setting up for you to tell the story of redemption. 
One thing I'm sick and tired of when it comes to the church are casual Christians. I'm not saying you're not a Christian, but casual Christians become Christian casualties. They become the moment that stuff begins to break down and people begin to feel hurt when they should be feeling loved and they begin to question life when we should be giving them life, when they're looking for ways to survive and we can say, no, this is how you live. You see, we have the answer to everything everyone's searching for. Yet we sit back and we pick and choose who we want to share with, but we don't have the confidence to share it. When Jesus is continually setting up intentional encounters for you to have intimate conversations, to watch an intense reaction, result, revival, because the one person that you tell might be the person that forgets their whole history and runs into the middle of the city and says, I need to tell you about this dude, Jesus. You see a beautiful thing about this guy named Noah is God gave him a task to build an ark. Didn't necessarily know what was coming. He had some instructions and God told him a little bit, but what he did is everybody else came by every day on the boards, cutting and nailing. He stayed faithful he stayed faithful. And when his neighbor came by and said, no, what the heck are you doing? He said, I'm staying faithful. I'm staying faithful. And the next time the guy came back to drop another load of lumber, he said, I'm staying faithful. I'm staying faithful. When there was a dude named Jonah who got swallowed by a fish because God told him to do something and he decided he'd wait a little bit, but delayed obedience is always disobedience, church. And there is someone that God is continually setting up an intentional encounter for you to stay faithful and to stay faithful and to stay faithful. You may have to invite them every single week because they forgot that you invited them the week before and you gotta stay faithful and stay faithful because their eternity has more value than you could ever imagine. It's more than a goldfish. It's more than whatever the most expensive thing you could ever purchase. Their eternity has more value in the eyes of Jesus because he created them and desired them and has a love for them that's immeasurable. That he gave his life for each and every one of us and yet we sit back and we hold it and we be casual about it when there's people's eternities in the balance. We're a church that's not just about being a church in the community, but we're a church about changing our community. We're a church about serving people, about loving people, about reaching people. When are we gonna be quit being a church that's just about it and be a church that's actually doing it? I don't know what's happened in the last couple of years of why the invites aren't going out. I don't know what's happened, why we don't feel like we need to come alongside with just serving someone and inviting them to church or doing a random act of kindness or what. It, I don't know what it is, but I hope today that you recognize that when you have an encounter set up for you, that delayed obedience is disobedience and Jesus is ready to work in someone's life through you. And all you have to do is obey. All you have to do is stay faithful because that's all he asks. And in, in inviting someone to church, you get to serve the community, you get to serve the kingdom as well as inviting someone to experience Jesus.